Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. You guessed it. Yep, more Ryzen benchmarks. However, what we have here is very interesting and I'm certain you guys will agree. Now, before we go on, please know that I'm not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes here. I do not have any Ryzen 5 CPUs yet. And if I did, I probably wouldn't be able to create this video anyway, as it would be in breach of the NDA. What I'm doing here is simulating Ryzen 5 performance, at least for the CPUs that have the full 16 megabyte level three cache. Now, I hope the title above, which states that this is simulated gaming performance, isn't deemed as clickbait. Uh, that certainly wasn't the intention. I feel that the testing here is very interesting, so let's move on. Last week, AMD announced the official specifications for the upcoming Ryzen 5 CPUs, which will come available in exactly three weeks' time. By announcing the few specifications that they did, they really let the cat out of the bag. We now know a few things that we had suspected for a while. Ryzen 5 is the same physical chip as Ryzen 7, so this means all models feature two CCXs, each with four physical cores, though not all of them will be enabled. The six core model, for example, features one core disabled from each CCX, while the quad core part features two cores disabled per CCX. One test I had planned to do since my initial Ryzen testing was play around with the down core function found in the BIOS of pretty much all AM4 motherboards. This function enables the ability to disable cores within the CCX modules or disable an entire CCX altogether. Something else I've been very keen to do when testing the 8 core Ryzen 7 CPUs is to do so using a range of GPUs. Thus far I've only benchmarked gaming performance using the Extreme Titan XP graphics card, so I thought it would be interesting to test not just with the Titan XP, but also with something a little more reasonable like the GTX 1070, where is it? Here. And then probably something more mid-range and even more affordable again, like the GTX 1060. So now armed with the knowledge of exactly how Ryzen 5 CPUs will be configured and the current ability to mimic those configurations, along with my desire to see how the gaming performance stacks up with a range of GPUs, I got to it. I decided to lock the Ryzen 7 1800X at 4GHz, since this is an achievable overclock for this chip. That said, I have been limited to 3.9GHz on some of my 1700X chips, and 3.8GHz on one of my 1700 chips, so a 4GHz overclock is by no means guaranteed for all Ryzen 7 processors. Anyway, at this frequency, I was able to simulate the overclocking performance of the Ryzen 5 1600X, as well as the Ryzen 5 1500X, assuming both are able to push all cores to 4 gigahertz. For the purpose of keeping all things equal across the Ryzen CPUs, I went with the same frequency for testing. Purely for comparison's sake, I went with the KB Lake CPUs, since they represent the very best gaming performance right now, at least in most titles. They also have no trouble hitting 4.8 gigahertz, and this can really be considered a mild overclock. So for testing, we have the dual-core, hyper-threading-enabled Core i3-7350K, quad-core 7600K, and quad-core hyper-threading-supported 7700K. Again, all were tested at 4.8 GHz to show the very best performance these chips have to offer right now, or close enough anyway. So for testing, I'm not interested in a clock-for-clock -clock comparison. We know KB Lake's IPC performance is slightly better. No need to go over that again. All CPUs, which do include the Ryzen models, were tested using DDR4-3000 memory. The GPUs included for testing are the GTX 1080 Ti, GTX 1070, and GTX 1060. Obviously, we didn't use AMD GPUs, as there's nothing that can replicate GTX 1080 Ti performance right now. There's no point replacing, say, the GTX 1060 with the RX 480, just to give the AMD GPUs a showing. I'd rather keep things more consistent. Finally, for this test, just six games were used, but with three graphics cards and six CPU configurations, that means there are 108 individual tests which require over 300 benchmark runs. So let's go check them out. I wanted to include Far Cry Primal, as this is a game where Ryzen really struggles. Disabling cores within the CCXs doesn't help improve performance here. Of course, we never expected that it would. However, I included the results because following this video, I would like to test the second CCX disabled to see what kind of performance that makes in games like Far Cry, where the Ryzen CPUs really struggle. I also included this game because I wanted to see how quickly we ran into a GPU bottleneck with less extreme GPUs. 
So here we see, even with all cores clocked at 4 GHz, the Ryzen CPUs are no match for even the Core i3. Meanwhile, we see strong gains when moving from the 7350K to the 7600K, and then again to the 7700K. Moving to the GTX 1070, we see that the KB Lake processors all bunch up, as this isn't a CPU-intensive title to begin with. The Ryzen CPUs aren't too far behind now, though they are still lagging behind even with a lesser GPU. Now with the GTX 1060 handling the rendering work, the Ryzen CPUs are pretty much on par with KB Lake. It's not that long ago that this kind of performance, which is roughly equivalent to that of the GTX 980, was considered extreme high-end. It seems Far Cry Primal has been developed in a way that just doesn't work that well with the Zen architecture. It's unlikely that we'll see a patch at this point to update the game to better support Ryzen, if that's even possible. Given the game's age, AMD will probably just have to suffer through some short-term pain on that one. I have found previously that disabling SMT really helps in Far Cry Primal, boosting performance by around 15%. So with Far Cry Primal we have a game that's not very CPU intensive and yet there's clearly some kind of issue with the Ryzen CPUs. For Honor is another game that is primarily GPU bound, and here we see that even with the GTX 1080 Ti handling the rendering work, the Ryzen CPUs are able to max it out. The same is true for the Core i3-7350K for example. That being the case, we find much the same with the GTX 1070 and again the GTX 1060. So not much to discuss here, but I just wanted to include another non-CPU intensive game just to see if what we saw in Far Cry Primal was unusual, and it seems it is. F1 2016 does use the CPU quite heavily, and here we see the Core i3-7350K really suffering in comparison to the Core i5 and Core i7 models. That said, performance was still very playable, it just looks much slower when using a high-end GPU. Even the 7700K offers strong gains over the 7600K here. Looking to Ryzen, we see much more consistent performance across the various models. The Quad Core 1500X, clocked at 4GHz, is able to match the 7600K at 4.8GHz, which is a pretty big deal here. In fact, the minimum frame rate was 6% greater, and of course the 1500X completely wastes the Core i3-7350K here. Moving to the slower GTX 1070, we see margins all close up, but again, we see consistent performance for the Ryzen parts. Interestingly, the 1500X offers much better minimum frame rates with the GTX 1070 than the 7600K does. Once we get down to the GTX 1060, things pretty much equal out across the board, and now the 1800X can be seen matching the 7700K. Next up we have Battlefield 1, and here the Core i3-7350K is considerably slower than the Core i5-7600K. Again, frame rates are still very high on the dual-core CPU, as we never saw dips below 80 FPS. The 1600X and 7600K deliver similar minimums, though it has to be said even with just 4 cores enabled, the Ryzen CPUs are still able to deliver very smooth performance. Dropping down to the GTX 1070 closes up the margin, and again we see that the Ryzen CPUs do deliver a better minimum result when compared to the 7600K. Now with the GTX 1060, things are pretty even, and for the most part well within the margin of error. Obviously this is down to the fact that we are running into a heavy GPU bottleneck, but it does give us a good idea of how real world gaming with a reasonably affordable GPU looks right now. Ghost Recon Wildlands is another game that isn't that taxing on the CPU. Still with an extreme high-end GPU, the Core i3-7350K does start to fall behind. Meanwhile, Ryzen delivers the same performance with 4 cores, 6 cores, and all 8 cores enabled. Moving to the GTX 1070, the margins between the various Ryzen configurations and the Core i3, Core i5, and Core i7 models are all very similar. Finally, with the GTX 1060 handling the rendering, it's just the Core i3-7350K that falls behind by a small margin. One game that I made sure was included was Mafia 3. The game loves threads and here we see technologies such as hyperthreading making a real difference. The Core i7 7700K for example was 41% faster than the 7600K when comparing the minimum frame rate. The simulated Ryzen 5 1500X configuration was able to match the much higher clock to 7600K, so that was impressive to see. Out of the box, the 1800X is actually slightly faster than the 7700K in this title. That said, once overclocked, the 7700K is able to pull ahead by about 10 FPS. The simulated 1600X was faster than the 7600K, while the 1500X was slightly slower for the average, but slightly faster for the minimum. This here is very interesting. We see yet again when dropping down to the GTX 1070, the Ryzen CPU seem to perform better than the Intel parts. I assume this is down to the fact that they provide better minimum frame rates, and these slower GPUs can't hit quite the same highs, which bring the average down. 
Anyway, using the GTX 1070, the 1800X and simulated 1600X are both faster than the 7700K, clocked at 4.8 GHz. Meanwhile, the 1500X is roughly on par with the 7600K, which is an impressive result given it's clocked 17% lower. Now with the GTX 1060 we find all CPU configurations deliver pretty much the exact same performance as we are of course GPU limited here. Well, quite a few interesting results were seen there in the small six game sample. What we have learnt is that for the most part, the six core Ryzen CPUs will perform very similar to that of the eight core models in today's CPU demanding titles. The four core or quad core parts will be slightly slower when using extreme GPU configurations in games such as Battlefield 1, Mafia 3 and F1 2016 for example. That said, with the exception of Far Cry Primal, it looks as though the quad-core Ryzen CPUs will still destroy the higher clocked dual-core KB Lake processors such as the 7350K. Even at 4.8GHz, the 7350K was no match in the more CPU-intensive titles. It was really interesting to find that when using the GTX 1070, the Ryzen CPUs were actually able to pull ahead in games such as Mafia 3. Meanwhile, those using a sub $300 US current generation graphics card won't see any difference between the quad-core AMD Ryzen and Intel KB Lake CPUs. Testing with the GTX 1060 naturally creates a serious GPU bottleneck, and it really represents the kind of performance you could see from extreme GPU at the 4K resolution. Well, actually that's probably not even true. I'd say that 4K is still more extreme when it comes to shaping the results. So it just goes to show that even with a high-end GPU such as the GTX 1080 Ti, testing CPU gaming performance at 4K really is quite useless. As it stands, we are still waiting for games that better utilize the Ryzen CPUs. And the good news is there are plenty of games on the horizon. Unfortunately right now there are a lot of games that make Ryzen look pretty average uh, and certainly not nearly as good as it actually is. Games such as Far Cry Primal, Civilization 6, Gears of War 4, Grand Theft Auto 5, Hitman, Total War Warhammer and Watch Dogs 2 for example all perform much weaker than expected on the Ryzen CPUs. That said though this isn't to say performance is bad, in fact gameplay is still incredibly smooth, it's just that the frame rates are lower than where you would expect them to be in relation to the Intel CPUs. The simulated 6-core and 4-core Ryzen 5 gaming performance that you have seen here should be identical to what we see in 3 weeks time, assuming they have no trouble running all cores at 4GHz. I also don't expect the Ryzen 5 parts to overclock any better than the Ryzen 7 CPUs, as they are essentially the exact same chips, with a few cores disabled. But you never know, though again we will know for sure in a few weeks time. What I can tell you is that the 1500X is going to be an incredibly good buy at $190 US or $275 Aussie, and you also get that Wraith Spire cooler in the package, so again, an amazing deal. The 1400 is a chip that had me the most excited initially before we found out the true specifications. It is $170 US or $245 Aussie, which is a 10% saving on the 1500X, but I'm not sure that'll warrant halving the available level 3 cache to 8 megabytes. Anyway, I'm very excited about these upcoming Ryzen 5 CPUs, especially given the performance that's been seen here in this video. Uh, Ryzen looked very impressive recently when I was testing out Mass Effect Andromeda. I took the 1800X and locked all cores at 4 GHz and compared that to a highly overclocked KB Lake 7700K, which was running at 4.9 GHz. And in Mass Effect Andromeda, the performance was very similar using a high-end graphics card. I think it was the Titan XP, or it might have been the GTX 1080 Ti. It doesn't matter. They're pretty much the same product. But yeah, very impressive performance in that new title. And this is a game that I will be adding to my battery of gaming benchmarks very soon. Well, that's all for this one, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm your host, Steve. Catch you again soon.